Okay, I'm going to call this uh, committee meeting to order. Welcome, everyone. This is the Monday, January 9th, 2023 meeting of the Minnesota Senate Committee on Transportation. Um, the time is 3.05. Hopefully, this is the last time we'll start this late in this committee. My goal will be to start committees on time. I'm State Senator Scott Dibble, and um, I will um, be the chair of this committee. I'm very proud and honored to, um, to be returning to the chair of this uh, committee. Um, I've been the chair in the past and, uh, and been the Democratic lead uh, in interim years. Um, members, I will call your attention to the agenda. Um, we're not taking action on any bills. However, we will be taking action on item number two, the confirmation of the Commissioner of Transportation, Nancy Daubenberger. But what's not on the agenda, as you might have anticipated, will just be some preliminaries and some introductions of ourselves um, and uh, just a little bit about this committee. So with that, uh, members, um, you all know me. Uh, I'll introduce myself, Scott Dibble, State Senator uh, from Senate District 61 in uh, Minneapolis, which is most of southwest Minneapolis, not quite all of it. I lost a little bit of it, and I lost portions of South Minneapolis that I represented, but I gained um, much of uh, the southern half of downtown Minneapolis and a little sliver of North Minneapolis. I've been in the state Senate since 2003, and I served in the House uh, for one term before that. And just a little bit about my interest in transportation. Um, for me, it's all about uh, doing those things that we need to do to be successful as a state, both as individuals, as families, as communities, and our economy. It's that thing that we do best to provide the critical infrastructure, to provide opportunities so people can access their lives, we can benefit our environment, and we can make sure that our community is as fair and equitable a place as possible for people, regardless of their circumstance and their walk of life. So that's the other part of my introduction, of your introductions. If you could talk a little bit about what you're interested in and what brings you to this committee. That would be uh, fantastic. So we'll introduce, oh, also staff, get ready, because we're going to want to hear from you and to say as much about yourselves as you're comfortable, including our, our research and partisan staff over at the far table. Um, but we'll start with members first, and I'll start on my right with our Republican lead, Senator Chesinski. And we'll just move down the table this way, and then we'll jump over this way, and then we'll go to our staff, and then we'll get on with the hearing. Oh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator John Jasinski, uh, just entering my seventh year of service here in the Senate. Uh, prior to that, I spent eight years as the mayor of Faribault and about 25 years on local boards and commissions before that. Uh, I served as the vice chair for all six years that I've been here. I uh, enjoyed that very much. Had a good relationship with Senator Dibble, uh, as well as the House and uh, Representative Hornstein, so I hope we have a good relationship. Uh, we're not always going to agree on a lot of things or some things, but I think having a, a good uh, conversation and getting along is very, very important. So I will continue that. To one of the biggest things of my concern uh, is getting some dedicated funding for small cities below the size of 5,000. Uh, they don't really have any dedicated funding, and uh, it's tough to plan for these small cities, uh, of which I have many in my community, I think, as well as all of us up here have those cities. Uh, so not knowing whether you're going to get funding one year and then funding not the next year is difficult for these small cities. Uh, so last year uh, we uh, had a bill with the auto part sales tax, and one of my amendments was is to get some dedicated funding, funding to small cities and townships. So I think that's important, uh, but overall understand we have to have a great transportation system across the state, uh, only from, uh, not only from uh, roads and bridges, but our airports, our ports, our transit, uh, and, every, and everything in between. So I think it's very important. Uh, I think it's a good committee to be on, a very important committee uh, for Minnesota, uh, and one that can uh, not always be so partisan. Uh, we should be able to agree on things to do to get across Minnesota to make sure that we can travel, uh, spend less time on the road, and more time either working or, or enjoying our, our state. So again, thank you. I'm pleased to serve uh, going into my seventh year and look forward to serving on the transportation. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Jim Carlson. I'm the state senator from uh, Senate District 52, uh, which includes Burnsville, Egan, Mendota Heights, and the city of Mendota. Uh, this is my 15th year in the Senate, and uh, I guess fortunately I've been 15 years with Senator Dibble on the Transportation Committee as well. And my interests, uh, I've got lots of interests, but uh, I retired from a, uh, two Fortune 500 companies. Uh, one was Ecolab, the other one was 3M, and uh, then retired once all as well from the Senate in 20, 
2010 when I lost a race, but then came back and uh, still uh, very, very motivated to get things done in Minnesota. This is the reason that I got into the Senate was to get things done. And what I recognize in transportation is that this, that's the economic backbone of our business, to be able to um, deliver goods and services to all of the people that uh, are in Minnesota. Plus, it's the, uh, the economic backbone of our people, because then they can get to places that they need to go to uh, take care of their personal issues and also perhaps uh, go out and buy things from these businesses in Minnesota and uh, add to our economic, and, uh, our economic vitality. So I, I think we have a very serious issue with uh, Minnesota with transportation. We're underfunded and we need to put funds in, like S Senator Jasinski said, into these small towns that need to build up their infrastructure. Plus, uh, uh, maybe uh, if I can say it, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Cedar Street here that you have to drive to to get to the parking ramp you know, that is so rough that uh, it makes my teeth get loose when I drive up that, <laughs> that uh, street. So I, I'm interested in doing as much as we can to make our transportation system something that is comparable to other systems in the world. While I was at my public uh, positions, I traveled the world. So I've been in many, many countries around the world in many different ways of, of uh, transportation. Uh, and in Europe, I've probably driven maybe 30,000 miles of, in all, uh, but also being on their public transportation, which is second to none. So I, I'm hoping that we can uh, look at things really uh, straightforward here, make sure that people have the ability to get where they want to go, no matter whether they are uh, disabled or perhaps not even uh, the uh, documented citizens, and other things that we have challenges and that we've been trying to fix. So. Thank you very much for your support, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Carlson. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, hello. My name is Julia Coleman. I represent the new Senate District 48, which is the eastern portion of Carver County. And my interest in this committee is because representing a portion of the fastest growing county in the state, we have significant infrastructure and road needs. Highway 18, Highway 5, to sprinkle in a few, <laughs> and want to be a loud voice for my community's needs here, and really look forward to working with all of you on transportation again. Thank you. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Senator Por Lindsay Ports. I represent District 55, which is Burnsville and Savage. This is my second term in the Senate, but my first on the Transportation Committee, and I'm excited to join you all. Um, I'm really interested in transit options, particularly in the suburbs and greater Minnesota, um, and addressing the climate impact of transportation. Thank you. Senator Morrison, Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Kelly Morrison, starting my first term in the Senate after spending four years in the House. Um, I represent the new Senate District 45, which is the entire Lake Minnetonka region, including uh, most of the city of Minnetonka. And when I'm not a legislature, legislator, I'm a physician, so I'm very interested in what we can do to make sure that Minnesotans are healthy and thriving, and transportation obviously is a big piece of that puzzle. So I'm really honored to be part of this committee and look forward to our work. Thank you. Senator Lang. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I don't know when you're not a legislator because I'm pretty sure that it happens all day, every day. <laughs> or at least it happens for me. They told me it was a part-time job when we got going yeah. here, but... Uh, yeah, you find out different in the grocery store. Yeah, absolutely. Quickly, huh? <laughs> uh, State Senator Andrew Lang, I represent uh, Senate District 16, which is the newly comprised district that is about 75% of my old district, uh, Canyon High County, uh, Renville County, Chippewa County, and now the western half of, of Meeker County. Um, I'm glad to be back on the Transportation Committee after a little bit of a hiatus. Uh, I had a couple years off after serving on the, the committee for, uh, you know, the, I don't even know when that was. It was a few years ago now. Uh, but yeah, very, very involved uh, in transportation issues in, in the district. Uh, I happen to have a district that has Highway 212, Highway 12, Highway 23 all going through it. So it uh, leads to me being pretty involved in the transportation industry even when I'm not uh, in it. But uh, that being said, looking forward to uh, a good productive year. Uh, hopefully uh, get some of those rural roads and bridges uh, funded. I've been uh, very active with the townships and, and uh, the funding for those in the past. And, I'd like to continue that in the future. So looking forward to the year. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Senator McCune. Thank you very 
Oh, thank you very much. And I apologize for running a little late today. I'm, I think I know everybody here. So um, I'm State Senator Jen McEwen. I represent Duluth. And this is my second uh, term serving and my second time uh, serving on the Transportation Committee. So I'm delighted to be back. Um, and um, to keep uh, learning more about transportation and to, to help with policy in this area. Uh, Duluth, as all of you know, is really the transportation hub for northern Minnesota and all of northeastern Minnesota and northwestern Wisconsin and the UP as well. We have a seafaring port in Duluth. We also have uh, rail and major freeways and highways running through. So it's a, a huge location for the transportation of goods and people and a lot of movement. So very happy to, to be on this committee and excited about the work ahead together with all of you. And an international airport. <laughs> and an international airport where the president has landed in Air Force One, yes. Yes, Ms. Ethier. My name is Beth Ethier. I'm the committee administrator for transportation. Last session I was Senator Dibble's legislative assistant. Um, my main background is in higher education, um, but I have a lifelong interest in city planning and transportation, so I'm excited to be working more deeply with this group of senators. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I'm going to announce that our amazing Senate Council, we, we just do it really great here in Senate Transportation because Ms. Stengel now has been promoted as the, for those of you who haven't heard, is going to be the new Director of Senate Council Research and Fiscal Analysis. So um, she's a short timer here, but we're really proud of her and it's a well-deserved uh, promotion and a huge congratulations to you. Welcome. Thank you. I suppose I don't need much more of an introduction than that. I'm Lexi Stengel, and I'm Senate Counsel. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Krista Boyd. I'm Fiscal Analyst for the committee. Um, that's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and both have, uh, have served the Transportation Committee for how long now have you both been with? Uh... This will be my 18th session, all with transportation. So. Right. This is year five or six for me. All right. So we're losing a lot of knowledge, institutional knowledge here. So, um, but no doubt whoever replaces you is going to be amazing. Um, all, all the people who hide out in the back, why don't you come up and grab a microphone and introduce yourself and tell us anything about yourself you would like. Nope, you're not safe, sorry. Pasco. I'm the Senate DFL researcher assigned to transportation. Um, prior to this, I was Senator Johnson Stewart's LA for two years. Uh, I'm Dom Linetti. I'm Senator Jasinski's LA. I got to be a little involved on transportation last session with him as vice chair on transportation, and I'm happy to still be involved this session. I'm Dave Frazier. I'm the Senate Republican researcher. This is going to be my sixth session on transportation and tenth in the Senate here. Uh, my name is Jack Fisher. I am Senator McEwen's legislative assistant, uh, and this is my first session. My name, my name is Sam Shackman, and I am a committee page for the Transportation Committee. Great. And we have another committee room page, Andrew. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. Got another another reliable committee page and, and so wave these guys and we'll have Andrew wave at you. If, if you need anything, flag them down, they can help you out. Um, so uh, we're, we will, I will also just wanted to spend one second um, touching on the jurisdiction of this committee so we're all aware and also for the benefit of the public. Um, so Ms. Uh, Boyd and Ms. Stengel are going to describe um, the the fiscal elements, the uh, accounts uh, for which we are responsible, and then a brief description of the committee jurisdiction, which is slightly different this year than it has been in the past. Ms. Boyd. Oh, Mr. Chair, um, uh, yeah, this will be quick. We have a lot shorter list than some other committees do. Um, basically, the accounts we cover would be the agencies of the um, entire Department of Transportation, Metropolitan Council, insofar as um, transit operations and metro mobility are concerned, 
and then um, roughly, I don't know, half of the public safety department, and those would be the divisions of driver and vehicle services, pipeline services, state patrol, which includes capital security, traffic safety, and administrative services at public safety. Um, and then just briefly, um, this is listed separately because I believe it mostly goes through MMB rather than MnDOT, if I'm correct, um, would be sort of tort claims um, against the Trunk Highway um, Fund. Ms. Stengel. Uh, just a few policy pieces to add. Uh, in addition to the entities Ms. Boyd described, there are also a couple of other offices. There's the Midwest Interstate Passenger Rail Compact Commission, the Minnesota Safety Council, Mississippi River Parkway Commission, and the State Airport Zoning Board. Uh, as Senator Dibble mentioned, there's a, a bit of a change in the jurisdiction this year as um, the Met Council will be under the jurisdiction of this committee. Um, in the past, the Metro Transit portion of Met Council has been under the jurisdiction, but the, the role has been expanded a little bit this year to also include the governance of the Met Council, so the, the structure of the governing body, um, as well as confirmation of the Metropolitan Council Chair and 16 members. Of course, the other uh, uh, confirmation for which we are responsible, um, we're going to be dealing with today, that's the Commissioner of the Department of Transportation. All right. Oh, I also wanted to mention in your packets, members, um, uh, our copy of, of Section 12 of the Senate Rules. Um, and so that's for you to peruse at your convenience um, so you know the, the rules under which we'll operating, under which we are operating, as well as the elements that come from the um, Senate policy book, um, some of which, of course, are a derivative of the rules that we abide by, and that has to do with um, procedure and, um, and, uh, and some of the uh, um, guidelines that we use in, in how we conduct committees in the Senate. So that's for your reference. Um, so preliminaries have been dealt with, and now we are ready to move on to the agenda. Uh, and we'll start with number one members. Um, we have uh, Chair Zelli and, um, and our regional administrator, Mary, Bo Mary Bogey, here. Chair Zelli is going to introduce um, this portion of the agenda. Yeah, please come forward. Um, and the reason um, we have them at the top, rather than um, having starting off with the commissioner's appointment is because Chair Zelli has to get down the hill to a meeting of the Met Council in a fairly distant, fairly not too distant, uh, very soon. Um, so, um, so we're trying to get them taken care of. Um, Ms. Bogey is here to um, do a little bit of an overview of the Met Council and, and what the Met Council does to familiarize ourselves. But mostly what we're interested in is the fiscal forecast. It's a little different in transportation this year than what we've been hearing about um, in the news and in the hallways and, you know, this uh, $18 billion surplus. Things are a little bit different when it comes to the funds that are key to transportation purposes. We'll hear the same um, from Mr. Kanadarud Hubinger from the Department of Transportation about the key drivers of the resources that MnDOT relies upon as well. It's not quite as robust or rosy a picture. So Chair Zelli, the floor is yours. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Senator Dibble. Uh, my name is Charlie Zelli. I am the chair of the Metropolitan Council and it's my great honor to give you an overview of the entire Met Council, maybe a little bit more focus on, on transportation. And um, I'm joined by Mary Bogey, who's the regional administrator and Mary will, as uh, Senator has pointed out, uh, really touch uh, uh, more deeply into the, into the budget issues. So <clears throat> there's a lot of slides and a lot of material, and uh, I apologize in advance, but I will move fairly quickly through this. This may be uh, old hat to many of you, but new to others. So um, I think it's a helpful grounding point to kind of give a, a view of this 50, some 55-year-old you know, local government organization, which is uh, uh, really a number of different roles, um, including operating transit, but really much more. Uh, first off, it isn't a state agency. It is a separate kind of regional government uh, uh, with a 17-member uh, board appointed by the governor. Um, it is really mandated uh, to, since 1967, 
uh, to uh, kind of uh, guide fundamentally a, uh, as a planning organization, uh, kind of a prudent regional um, uh, approach to this metropolitan area. Uh, curiously enough, you think about a seven county area, but that's 180 separate municipalities. And uh, I will get into what it means, but in addition to transit and transportation planning, uh, we operate the largest uh, housing redevelopment authority. Um, we uh, administer Section 8 housing vouchers. Uh, we work with uh, partner uh, park agencies, uh, as many as 55 regional parks. Uh, we were finding out where we are a conduit for, for funds and various uh, grant programs. Uh, important to consider three major divisions of the Metropolitan Council. You're very familiar with transportation. I'll go deeply into what that is. Uh, but environmental services uh, is a fairly robust uh, part of uh, Metropolitan Council activity. We operate uh, all the wastewater uh, uh, for the metro area uh, through a number of plants. We actually measure and we do a lot of deep research on water and water planning. Um, in addition, uh, our community development uh, division uh, actually uh, manages, in addition to housing, we do quite a bit of uh, work with local communities, both as a resource, but also uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a granting agencies uh, for funding and supporting uh, sustainable uh, uh, development. Um, so getting into transportation. Uh, there is um, two fundamental parts of our transportation function. Uh, again, we're the main kind of metropolitan planning organization. We do that primarily through the metropolitan planning uh, uh, MPO uh, activity, which I'll get to uh, more deeply in a minute. Um, but we do that uh, really through um, a lot of the work uh, with our transportation advisory board, uh, which I'll get into in a minute, but that is a federal uh, function and that is often associated with our role as a conduit for federal funds, both for planning and for uh, actually determining uh, 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 actual uh, uh, grants. And of course, transit operations. We operate the largest of our operations is Metro Transit, but we also support other uh, regional transportation entities, uh, as well as, uh, as we've described, Metro Mobility and and some other um, services that uh, come directly under our purview. Let's go into Metro Transit. That's what people really think of when you think of Metropolitan Council. It is uh, directly our large, it is the largest transit operation in the state. Uh, it is a robust uh, system uh, that covers uh, nearly the entire metropolitan area, 900 buses, light rail, uh, as well as commuter rail. Um, when you uh, think about uh, transit, it really is an integrated system of buses and, uh, and, uh, and, and light rail. And it is a system uh, that is expanding, even during this period of, of COVID when ridership was uh, uh, really uh, hampered considerably by uh, the health of our, uh, of our community. So I'll just talk about ridership for a minute. Uh, you'll see the different kinds of service we have. Um, it is recovering slowly. And uh, you notice that red line is bus rapid transit. That's probably our best performer when you think about, uh, and we'll talk about the A line, the C line, and also now uh, orange line. Uh, there are areas where uh, it operates almost like light rail, but on city streets. Uh, and uh, we find that it has the largest recovery. Now that actually only constitutes about 10% of our system, but it is the one that is expanding and will be expanding more over the next seven years uh, than, than almost any other. Uh, local bus is still uh, down, but uh, recovering, uh, as is light rail. Probably the most affected by our COVID ridership has been the commuter express service. Now, North Star, we've always heard about, that is a, an express service. It's down as much as, you know, at one time, 95%. Now it's recovered a little, but uh, uh, other express service, whether it's suburban transit or metro transit express service, 
um, is uh, been uh, the most uh, affected, in part because these are the service that goes from a suburban point directly uh, to downtown. And the downtown, uh, this really f reflects downtown employment. Now, curiously enough, that actually only represents less than 10% of our service. So if you think about the future of transit, and, and I'll get to that in a minute, we're finding much more robust uh, service uh, increases, um, ridership increases in some of the everyday, uh, day-long kind of local uh, trips. And you'll see that in local bus service as well as the, uh, as the BRT. Um, one of the uh, interesting things about uh, the, the, uh, what we're seeing in ridership now is less of the regular kind of nine to five commuter. Uh, we're finding uh, perhaps if there is such a thing as the busiest period, maybe it's like one big hump in the middle of the day. People aren't necessarily coming in the morning and in the evening, but they're using transit considerably uh, in different ways. And our recent survey which is just a pilot of a more robust survey that we're uh, doing now, and it'll be, that statistics will be ready uh, later this year. Um, but uh, we're finding that uh, more trips for uh, community uh, social purposes, uh, certainly school, getting groceries, it isn't just about getting to a job, although we certainly uh, carry that as well. The one thing I would say about the ridership over the COVID period is people kind of thought transit was dead. Well, we carried as many as 80, 90,000 people a day. And even though we were advertising, don't take a bus to preserve some more social distancing, we had very busy schedules. And although essential workers only, we had some like the number five, which is now kind of the C line, and, I'm sorry, the D line, and uh, others, uh, where really people really relied on buses to get to work and get on uh, with their lives. So there was no such thing as a, uh, as a loss of transit, but it did shift. And, it, and it's coming back in interesting ways that we find uh, shows the necessity of this integrated uh, transit system um, going forward. Um, one of the biggest challenges we have, certainly, is workforce. And uh, we have a shortage of drivers. Uh, and operators of uh, light rail. And this graph really shows how much uh, our service has been reduced. Uh, we're probably somewhere in the area of 70% uh, based on service miles of where what we were operating uh, several years ago. Now, part of that is by choice because we knew that there was lower riderships, but most of it is because uh, we are recruiting and looking for more operators. Uh, and I can say this both as a private sector uh, bus person as well as the transit, as well as any other commercial drivers, whether they're snow truck drivers or, or truck drivers, there is a shortage of CDL uh, operators. Having said that, we've done a number of different initiatives recently that we think are making a big difference. Maybe the biggest of one of which is that a renegotiated contract with the Magomed Transit Union has a starting wage over $26, which is a substantial increase. And our last two job fairs were fully subscribed, and we actually have now a much more optimism about our hiring practice and the additional 200 uh, operators that we're seeking really over the next, uh, this next six uh, uh, to 12 months. Um, so although we are feeling optimistic, it continues to be a challenge. And of course, some of this reduction in service Ridership becomes kind of self-fulfilling. If, if you have less product, people are using it less. But we think that uh, there's opportunities this first half of this year to start increasing service as we recruit and retain more employees. So this is uh, the map of transit ways over the next seven years. Uh, some of these are operating, like the blue line, the green line, but, uh, and, or the A line, which is the arterial bus rapid transit, and the C line. But you can see the, the additional uh, arterial bus rapid transit systems that are in the pipeline, many of them funded, many of them are not funded yet, but uh, have really shown how this uh, is an integrated system. It isn't just point A to point B, it's not just downtown to the suburbs. 
it is really, as you can see, some, some of these lines uh, will take us kind of across the metro. And as one connects to the other, uh, the B line under construction, when you think about it going from the Green Line extension past many different transit ways, it will really, uh, in a very uh, significant way, will shorten this kind of commuter time or uh, kind of transit access time to less than a half an hour for uh, much of, uh, of the residents of the, of the metro area. And all this is happening uh, between now and 2030. So, uh, you know, as they say, this isn't a pie in the sky long-term vision. This is really in front of us. And when we think about our operations and we'll get into the cost of those operations, uh, it's really imperative we think about that uh, now. As we think about some of the major initiatives that we need to face uh, and we are facing going forward, uh, I could be here for another uh, couple hours, but Commissioner Daumberger would be upset if I did that, so I won't. Uh, but uh, when uh, really, number one, our safety and security action plan. This is a 25-point plan, and it involves some things that we could use some help with, but many of the things that we're doing, it's our highest priority. If we don't have a safe and welcoming environment for our customers, we can't expect our customers to return and use our service. And that is not lost on us. It's very complicated. We're doing a number of different initiatives, which I'm happy to talk about in the future. Some of it involves uh, bringing in private contractors to be on site in certain hotspot transit areas uh, all the time. Uh, we are using data. We are using uh, best practices from around the country. Uh, and we believe that we can make a difference. Knowing that much of what's happening with crime is a societal issues, nonetheless, we have to take responsibility for what we can manage and we need, and we are leaning uh, into those areas. Uh, we've talked about workforce recruitment and development, very important uh, for us to uh, focus on that. Um, our zero emissions plan, we have a full zero emission uh, fleet plan uh, which has been laid out, uh, and we know that there's uh, an opportunity for some great uh, federal funding, IIJA funding, uh, to advance uh, and to meet our kind of electrification program. Um, and knowing that uh, transit is always carbon, uh, uh, you know, neutral, not neutral, but uh, carbon uh, 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 reduced in terms of bringing uh, a number of people out of cars, but actually electrifying the drivetrain itself is really uh, could make a substantial difference. Our new uh, garage opening in Minneapolis in North Loop uh, in March has all the charging infrastructure in place. So it's not just buying electric buses, it is building out a system to support those electric buses through the charging stations and the infrastructure. And we have great partners both in Minneapolis, St. Paul, as well as uh, XL. People, have, you've maybe heard about uh, speed and reliability. This is more than just traffic light preemption, although that's an important element. It is a very systematic way of creating our bus system to be more efficient, to be more timely, and to, uh, you know, one of the greatest ways to uh, gain ridership and provide a service is to improve the service we have. And we know that this is, again, takes time, is systematic, uh, and a very important program. And then we talk about pass, uh, uh, passes, uh, making them more affordable. Students is a clearly really important demographic of customers. Uh, we've just an, recently announced our program with the University of Minnesota. Uh, every student has a universal pass. We want to roll that out to other constituencies, uh, not just colleges. Um, and then, of course, just to sell our de uh, the idea that we have $1 fares available, many of the people who could most use those cheap fares don't know about it. So part of it is, is communicating and selling the low fare opportunities that, 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 that we have. Um, getting into our other division beyond Met Transit, our Metropolitan Transportation Services. This is the division that operates uh, some of our uh, smaller uh, uh, vehicle operations, uh, Metro Mobility, Transit Link, but also contracts quite a bit of our work with uh, other uh, private agencies to provide that service. In addition, it is a very uh, a robust planning uh, organization. This is really the group that manages our MPO. 
and then uh, it develops our, uh, our, uh, our, our, our transportation plans. Uh, we also administer uh, grants uh, to some of our, uh, our partners, including our, our regional partners. Uh, one word on uh, the law, many people ask, we actually are governed both by federal and by state laws, and, and we are in compliance with a number of different uh, uh, statutes, uh, which is uh, something that, is, uh, that our MTS division uh, uh, tracks uh, uh, pretty thoughtfully. Uh, important that when you think about the transportation policy plan, it's part of the family of plans that the Metropolitan Council uh, manages. Both the surface transportation and the aviation plan is part of our TPP, transportation policy plan, uh, but also uh, we have a wastewater and a park plan that is part of our family of plans. So when you think about the transportation policy plan, how it intersects with land use, how it intersects with the kind of larger development goals of the metropolitan area, uh, it is uh, something that is uh, uh, very uh, strong and it is very consistent with our kind of our regional vision, our regional uh, uh, thrive vision uh, that we uh, uh, advance. Uh, the, uh, uh, the goals of our uh, TPP are really consistent with the kind of values of the Council and the Thrive 2040 vision. Um, safety, security, stewardship, healthy and equitable communities. Uh, and uh, when you, again, think about uh, what transportation investments do, they do a lot more than just provide access for people to go from here to there. They become catalysts for community uh, development. So in that respect, it really helps uh, to provide uh, uh, a, a kind of a leverage point for some of these regional land use uh, goals that uh, we have as a, uh, uh, as a region. Uh, getting a little bit into the weeds on the MPOs. People really ask, is the Metropolitan Council the MPO? And yes, it is true. It is within our jurisdiction. It is really managed in part through the uh, Transportation Advisory Board. And this planning process um, is uh, first, as I mentioned, the transportation planning uh, policy, but also uh, it lends and right directly into our transportation improvement program. This is the near term four-year program and really a list of projects. For that regard, we work very closely with MnDOT and other stakeholders. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, the TAB, the Transportation Advisory Board, is um, allocating uh, the federal funds uh, to implement actual projects. You probably read about it recently. Uh, a regional solicitation ended up with as much as $350 million, which is uh, 150 more than other uh, periods of time. Uh, due to this new infrastructure bill. And so there's, it really is significant uh, in how through this planning process and then ultimately in actual project selection uh, ends up uh, being a, uh, a tremendous um, catalyst for, uh, for infrastructure uh, investment. Uh, the TAB, as I mentioned, uh, is a really a collection of, of, of public officials. 34 member board uh, 18 of which are elected. Um, so when you think about uh, like coalition uh, COGS, coalition of government officials, that's really what the TAB Transportation Advisory Board is. And this is really the heart of our MPO role. Uh, the, uh, the TAB uh, uh, has a number of really important functions in addition to providing a forum for those community members around the region uh, it recommends uh, the program and it re recommends uh, the projects. And when I say recommend, it comes with the, uh, the recommendations to the uh, Metropolitan Council board itself. But the Metropolitan Council does not um, actually uh, revise or change any of those recommendations. It simply accepts and concurs with their report. So the real uh, thrust of these decisions of this MPO is at the Transportation Advisory Board. The Metropolitan Council, although the home of the TAB, is the uh, body that simply uh, accepts 
the uh, programs determined by the tab. So when you're thinking about governance, when you're thinking about transportation allocations, the tab and the advisory board and understanding how its function is really at the heart of when you think about uh, transportation uh, uh, investment uh, governance. So again, uh, the transportation services uh, does a lot of uh, uh, contracting with private uh, providers who provide this valuable transit service. Uh, Metro Mobility um, uh, has uh, been mentioned is, is, a, is a mandated service. Uh, it will become a, uh, a uh, programmed uh, service in future budgets, uh, a forecasted item in future budgets. Uh, uh, and uh, in addition, it provides other uh, uh, programs like a Metro Van Pool, Transit Link, uh, and, uh, and other services. Uh, just to show a little bit about Metro Mobility, uh, there is a mandated uh, region uh, for ADA service. That is a federal mandate. Uh, the state has uh, increased that area to what we call a non-ADA service. Uh, the priority for service is in the ADA service area, but our goal and our hope is that we will cover all requests in the larger uh, service area, the larger gray area. Um, just a word on ridership within Metro Mobility. We actually, during the pandemic, uh, were very uh, entrepreneurial in using uh, the contracts and the service providers to deliver food, to help provide service for healthcare workers during the pandemic. Uh, but now ridership is really back, almost to where it was in 2019. So uh, we expect this area, demographically, it will continue to grow. Uh, but again, it provides the service uh, that it always has and uh, back to what it was. Uh, in addition, I should mention the uh, number of uh, express routes that we provide uh, to the suburban areas, mostly through Metro Transit itself, but we do offer uh, grants and support for uh, four regions uh, that are operated by what sometimes is referred to as suburban transit providers, very robust uh, systems themselves, uh, Minnesota Valley Transit Authority, Southwest Maple Grove, Plymouth, and then of course we have a relationship with the University of Minnesota. So we provide both capital grants, we conduit for federal uh, uh, supportive funds, um, and it is definitely, we think, part of the regional uh, network. Um, we're getting into the financial areas, so I will defer to Administrator Bogey, who will get into where we are with the numbers and why the, this year is a particularly interesting in terms of where we are with the budgets, particularly as we look over the next two biennials. Uh, members will hear from Regional Administrator Bogey, and then we'll pause for uh, questions sensitive to the fact that Chair Zelli and Regional Administrator, do you need to get down the hill too? Yes. All right. So, okay, we'll try to we'll try to make our questions really smart and efficient and concise. All right, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, thank you again. I'm Mary Bogey, the Regional Administrator for the Metropolitan Council. Um, and as the Chair said earlier, you know, a lot of good news swirling around the, the state forecast and an $18 billion surplus. And, and that's, that's great and it really leads us to believe that, you know, all our programs should be in, in really good shape. Um, but the forecast doesn't paint as rosy a picture when it comes to the anticipated performance of motor vehicle sales tax. Um, and just for reference, motor vehicle sales tax represents pre-pandemic about 45% of our transportation budget and, and post-pandemic now about 50%. Bogey, can you pull your uh, microphone a little closer? To yep, I'll try to get just a little closer here. All right, and, and post-pandemic is about 50% of, of our revenues for the transportation program. Um, as you can see in this chart here with, with the, the green line representing the new forecast and, and the blue line representing February of 2022, motor vehicle sales tax continues to grow. Um, but what we're seeing in this forecast is a loss of over $100 million over the term of the forecast. And you know, that has a, a very significant impact on our forecast then for how we deliver services 
to the region. Um, by comparison, if we look at the last time we experienced this kind of a forecast loss, that was back in, in February 2017 to February of 2018 forecast, and that was an $81 million forecast loss. So as we put together our budget and our forecast for the future, um, we need to assume that the forecast is correct until the next forecast comes out. And so we've been adjusting our projections for the future to reflect the, the new February forecast, or November forecast, sorry. Um, you know, this volatility that we see in the motor vehicle sales tax um, really can be driven by a number of things. Um, certainly it's driven by the current economy. And as you can imagine, when, when we're a little bit of a tightening economy, people put off that big purchase. So, you know, buying that, that new car goes goes off to, to the future and we focus on buying our groceries and, and, and caring for our families. But we're also experiencing something a little bit different in this environment. We're also experiencing some supply chain issues. And so even if I wanted to buy that next vehicle because of chip shortages and things like that, there's the inventory just isn't available as well. Um, we'll also see things like this pent-up demand, and we saw that a little bit in 2021 um, where there was a pent-up demand over um, going through that, that heavy COVID year of 2020, a little bit of pent-up demand in 2021 that saw us come up a little bit, and then we see a little bit of, of flattening out of that curve. And so I do think that there's a number of things that, that are impacting the volatility there. Um, also, I would say that this inverse relationship exists between the council's ridership on our transit system and the performance of motor vehicle sales tax. When, when the economy is tight a little bit, people tend to ride transit more and our ridership goes up. Um, when we see, see motor vehicle sales tax doing really well because the economy is better, people are then out buying those cars and I'm asking them to park them in their garage and jump on transit. So just that kind of inverse relationship of, of this funding source to, to the transit system just creates a, just another uniqueness for us. So let's take a look at, at kind of what that does to, to our outlook. Um, and as we look over the next couple of bienniums, um, with a heavy reliance on our one-time federal relief funds, um, we are still able to push off that impending fiscal cliff out to the 26-27 biennium, but it has grown significantly since we were back here in the previous um, session discussion discussing where, what our outlook was. So I just want to remind that this structural cliff um, is not something new. It's something that we've been, been back before you um, in the past talking about. Um, there's been a history of one-time fixes, um, including back in, in state fiscal year 28, 2019, in, in responding to that last forecast loss for motor vehicle sales tax. Um, there was a $70 million state appropriation that was one time and expired and, and then not available for 2020, 2021. And you can see how, how that non-base appropriation fell off in, in those years. So in addition to, to updating for the motor vehicle sales tax forecast, we also updated some projections, assumption projections in this forecast. Um, we brought our service levels down. Um, so this reflects a service level of about 70% up to about 90% in state fiscal years 26, 27. Uh, it also reflects 15 minute intervals for our light rail system rather than 10 minute intervals, but we recover to those as we go closer to 26, 27. Um, it also has a downward assumption related to ridership and fare collections and that kind of follows, this, if I'm not putting the service out there, um, of course, we're going to see less ridership and, and then less fare collection. And then we also adjusted for wages. Um, the chair talked about um, increasing wages for, for our operators to address a shortage there. Um, the same for our um, officers to, to bring that starting wage up so that we can address um, having our, our police department fully staffed and, and putting uh, more people onto the system. So I just wanted to show here um, how much the federal relief funds have meant to us. Um, if you look here, and again, um, the, the fiscal cliff is, is not new. It's, it's something that we've been facing and, and putting kind of those Band-Aids on. Um, but for those federal relief funds, um, we would have been much sooner in, in dire need. 
um, but also recognize, if we flip back to that, to that last slide, um, that we're facing a pretty significant um, funding cliff that, that will hit us in, the, in not this current biennium, but in the next biennium. And with that, Mr. Chair, we will stand for questions. Um, thank you, um, Ms. Bogie, um, and thank you for mentioning that yeah, the fiscal cliff has been looming out there. We've been talking about it for, I think, five or six years now. Um, the paradox of the pandemic was the uh, federal relief fund. I mean, we've been, of course, papering over it with uh, reserves um, for some period of time. Um, then the federal relief funds come, came in and uh, more paper. Um, but at some point, um, we will have to pay the piper. Questions, members? All right. I have a bunch, but uh, I'll save them in the interest of time. Um, and they're, they're back on some of the uh, elements of, of the presentation. Um, maybe uh, uh, Chair Zelli and uh, Mr. Shetnan, um, uh, the, uh, I'll convey them to you and... Um, We'll share those with the committee by email. All right, anything further? Oh, Senator Coleman, my pardon, my apologies. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had one brief question. I was really interested in your safety action plan. Would we be willing to get send us a copy of that? I would love to learn more about what that entails. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Senator, Mr. Chair. we'd be happy to share that with you, and, uh, and, and we're happy to return and go into details to kind of where we are. Uh, and each of the initiatives, we actually have a quarterly report before the council from uh, Metro Transit and the Metro Transit Police on kind of, uh, you know, our progress. Um, so uh, we're happy to do that for you, but I will send you the plan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Commissioner Zell. So a question, so we recently got the federal funds grant signed and, and that's all confirmed. Uh, as far as Southwest light rail overruns, tell me who pays those cost overruns. Is it the Med Council or is it Hennepin County? For all the overruns that we're going to see and are seeing, who is responsible for those overruns? So we have it on the record. Uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, Senator Chesinski, uh, uh, to date, uh, there has been a shared uh, commitment to solve the budget gap from all of our partners. Uh, clearly, Hennepin County has the, been the lead local funding partner. Uh, federal government has been uh, a very strong supporter and, and funder. Um, and uh, we have been in conversation with particularly those two entities uh, for the past year, year and a half. Um, I think the most uh, recent um, announcement was funding from uh, Hennepin County that came largely from their transit sales tax uh, uh, sources. Um, we were able to uh, uh, take some of the Carissa funds that would uh, uh, that was originally given to us uh, to Met Council uh, for operations, but also COVID-related, uh, you know, cost increases. So. That $100 million um, uh, was determined not to uh, erode the funding gap this next biennium, um, but it, and it certainly is qualified, and our federal FTA encouraged us to use uh, some of those, those funds. We also um, uh, have received um, a limited amount of funding just recently from the, from the federal government as, uh, due to a kind of a year-end budget um, uh, uh, a bill that legislation had passed that was somewhere in the area of $27 million. Um, so I guess what I'd say is there's no one specific source. Metropolitan Council has limited uh, funds because of most of our, all of our funding has really been deployed for operations or various needs. We don't have a separate funding element for transit waste. However, uh, we certainly have been uh, looking under every couch cushion, and uh, we think that uh, going forward, uh, getting through this next year and a half, uh, area of the most risk uh, on this project to finish the Kenilworth Tunnel, 
um, we'll have a better uh, idea exactly what that remaining gap is in time to uh, continue to look for solutions. Yeah, Mr. Chair. Senator Jasinski. So, and, and going to that, and you showed the kind of the cliff that's happening. So isn't that going to shorten that up sooner? Isn't that going to happen sooner? Because we have to dedicate more money to the shortfalls we're seeing in Southwest Light Rail? Well, uh, sure. uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, I really consider these funding cliffs to be operations, which is really the highest priority uh, for us. And then the capital costs of some of the capital transit ways that we're building are really uh, quite uh, separate. Uh, and we know that capital funds are separate from our operating funds. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Anything further, members? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Let's take a moment for a little technology transition and then we'll move to the next item. Right. Commissioner, please come forward. Welcome to the committee, Commissioner. And uh, please introduce yourself for the record <coughs> and proceed with your um, testimony um, on behalf of your uh, appointment, uh, confirmation as Commissioner of the Department of Transportation members. There's a packet in your um, there's material in your packet that contains the governor's transmittal of his appointment of Commissioner Dobmerberger, which includes um, a number of items, including her resume and her financial disclosures, a couple of letters uh, in support of her appointment and the like. Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon. And good afternoon to you, Mr. Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Nancy Daubenberger, and I was recently appointed to the Commissioner of the Department of Transportation. Thank you for the opportunity to share a bit about myself and for your consideration of my confirmation as Commissioner. So a little bit of personal background. I grew up in rural southern Minnesota on a hobby farm. My father raised beef cattle for most of my life. My parents were both military veterans, and they both had careers in public service. I currently live in Woodbury with my husband, Mark, and where we raised two children. I highly value my church community, and I've enjoyed volunteering in the religious education programs, teaching faith formation, providing child care. And I also enjoy participating in STEM outreach programs for school-aged children, as well as working with college students in civil engineering programs on their capstone projects. The over 10,000 lakes and thousands of paved and natural surface trails in Minnesota have provided me much joy in pursuing my hobbies of swimming, cross-country skiing, bicycling, and running. I've especially enjoyed the camaraderie and team building I've experienced with my coworkers and industry partners in running and bicycling groups. Now for career experience. Prior to my current role, I served as MnDOT's Deputy Commissioner and Chief Engineer the Assistant Commissioner for Engineering Services, the State Bridge Engineer, and I also previously served in planning, project management, and design roles for the MnDOT Bridge Office, as well as the MnDOT Metro District. Before coming to MnDOT, I worked in consulting for about six years in both road and bridge design and project management. I hold a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from North Dakota State University and a Master's degree in Civil Engineering from the University of Minnesota. My 23 years of previous MnDOT experience and six years of consultant experience provide me with a unique and broad picture of all the various stakeholders with whom MnDOT partners, as well as the ability to work towards shared goals with many stakeholders over the years. 
I was appointed by Governor Walls as chair of the Minnesota Envir Environmental Quality Board, EQB, and I co-chair both the Governor's Sustainable Transportation Advisory Council and the Governor's Advisory Council on the Connected and Automated Vehicles. I serve on the board of directors for the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, or AASHTO, as we call it, and I currently serve as president for the Mid-America States Regional Group of AASHTO. As a member of AASHTO, I serve as chair on the Committee on Right-of-Way Utilities and Outdoor Advertising as, and as the convener of the Intercommittee Working Group on Electric Vehicles. And I serve on the Professional Advisory Board for the University of Minnesota's Department of Civil, Environmental, and Geoengineering. A notable past career highlight prior to my current roles, I'm especially proud of the legislature's and MnDOT's collective response to the I-35W bridge collapse and my work with the 2008 legislature to establish the Trunk Highway Bridge Program to repair and replace structurally deficient and fracture critical bridges. While I'm new to the commissioner role, as deputy commissioner and chief engineer, MnDOT accomplishments include we implemented the first year of federal funding as part of the five-year Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, IIJA, and MnDOT was successful in pursuing federal discretionary grant funding and supporting local agencies and tribal governments in their pursuit of federal funds, and we're continuing to pursue discretionary grant funding. We finalized the update to our statewide multimodal transportation plan. So Min Minnesota is facing many challenges, shifts in population, economy, environment, technology, travel, behavior and safety um, are affecting how people move, how we move people and goods around the state. It's important that we proactively plan to address these changes so we can achieve our vision of a multimodal transportation system that maximizes the health of people, the environment, and the economy. The planning process of our SMTP focused on six topics that will shape Minnesota's future and our transportation system. Aging infrastructure, climate change, economy and employment, equity, safety, and transportation options. These focus areas were chosen by the public, our stakeholders, and partners to reflect the most urgent issues facing our communities and will guide our transportation system for years to come. Every five years, MnDOT updates the SMTP, and that's Minnesota's highest level policy plan for transportation. It looks at all types of transportation and evaluates the status of the system, what's changing, and how we're gonna move forward over the next 20 years. We finalized the 22 update in December, and we're implementing the plan. We also completed the first round of public engagement for the Minnesota State Highway Investment Plan, or MNSHIP. MNSHIP is MnDOT's tool for deciding and communicating capital investment priorities for the state transportation system for the next 20 years. Our transportation system is aging, and current funding from MnDOT is not enough to meet our system's needs. To build a modern, multimodal transportation infrastructure that provides options and best serves all Minnesotans, we need additional sustainable and long-term transportation funding. We're currently using the feedback we received uh, to set a draft investment direction that we'll be sharing with stakeholders later this winter for additional feedback. MnDOT worked with the city and county engineers, metropolitan planning organization, tribes, and other local partners to identify and review all priority investments that they have identified for the state highway system. And we reviewed those to see which are already accounted for in our estimation of needs and which are not. And that's a number we're now sharing in addition to our estimate of needs, which is another five to six billion in city, county, local identified priority investments. We completed a federally approved National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure or NEVI plan for Minnesota that describes how Minnesota will spend the first year of NEVI formula uh, program dollars, the federal funds that came to us. And our plan includes a vision and goals for a statewide fast charger network that provides convenient, reliable, and accessible EV charging across Minnesota. The plan also identifies potential exits along two of our alternative fuel corridors, Interstates 35 and 94, where the agency could partner with others to host, excuse me, host and install fast chargers with year one of the NEVI funding. We also launched 
three connected and automated vehicle pilot programs over the last few years. The Rochester Med City Mover, which wrapped up last summer after providing over 3,000 rides, and a final report is in progress. The White Bear Lake Bear Tracks suburban area demonstration launched last summer as well. And the Go Marty project in Grand Rapids launched in October of last year, and that's, that's operating uh, five Toyota Siennas equipped with automated driving systems. Over 500 rides have been given so far on, um, on those to uh, Toyota Siennas, and uh, many with, for people with mobility challenges. And MnDOT is also in the process of learning how connected and automated vehicle technology can be used in heavy vehicles, testing this in our work zones with autonomous truck-mounted attenuators. So looking ahead to the next four years, I really look forward to carrying out the Walls Flanagan Administration's One Minnesota Plan and refreshing MnDOT's strategic plan in alignment with it, most notably in the areas of climate, healthy Minnesotans, economic recovery, advancing racial equity and inclusion, fiscal accountability, and measurable results, which also align with our statewide multimodal transportation plan. I also look forward to continuing to implement the federal funding that came to us through the IIJA in the next four years, and working alongside our local and tribal governments as we continue to pursue and expand competitive grant funding, including dollars to improve resiliency, invest in carbon reduction, and expand our EV charging infrastructure. MnDOT will need to be poised to deliver projects quickly while being thoughtful about our investments and effectively engaging the public and our stakeholders, including legislators, in advancing transportation equity. So in closing, I'm excited to continue to work with you, our legislators and our industry partners, as we shape transportation policy and deliver our transportation programs. You are critical partners in planning, building, operating, and maintaining a multimodal transportation system that maximizes the health of people, the environment, and the economy. It's important to me to be accessible to you and a trusted source of information. I might not always have an answer right at my fingertips, but I will be responsive, and I might not always have the answer you want to hear, but I will be transparent with you so you can place your trust in me and in MnDOT. Thank you for your consideration of my confirmation. I stand for questions. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Members, questions? So I have a question. Um, we have the, uh, you probably covered it in your overview, um, but um, it's worth kind of just visiting uh, in free form. Um, I think we're proud of the fact that in Minnesota we have the fifth largest uh, roadway system. Um, I love, I'm fond of saying that's not the fifth largest per capita, that's the fifth largest by miles. Um, what is it, 80 or 90 percent, of course, is, is owned and managed by local units of government. Um, but nevertheless, it's one uh, roadway system. Um, and it, of course, was built by the generations that preceded us, for the most part. And um, that is now decades uh, in the past. And so it's a roadway system and a bridge system that is in need of upkeep. Uh, and we have a gap in being able to keep up with all of that, and so it's deteriorating. Both the trunk highway system that we own and operate, I think 10% of the 10 to 15 or 20% of the roadway miles, which takes the converse, the, the relationship is the converse, takes 80 or 90% of the miles traveled by vehicle. Um, but every road, you know, every uh, trip uh, starts and ends on a local road, but the vast majority of our travel is done on the state-owned system. Um, and so as we look uh, to the future uh, and that gap that we have in keeping up with and, and maintaining and, and repairing, doing some capacity improvements where needed, improving for safety, um, how do you envision engaging with the legislature, the public, et cetera, to address that need? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Minnesota's infrastructure is indeed aging, and current funding levels uh, for MnDOT will not meet those long-term needs. Um, as I noted, I support implementing a sustainable long-term transportation funding solution, and certainly look forward to working with legislators on any proposals they have to explore 
various options for bringing more transportation revenues to Minnesota. Uh, another question. Um, if uh, one of, as you're concluding, um, you were, you talked about uh, uh, measuring uh, results, um, and I think it's becoming well accepted that a, a, a better measure of our transportation system, what we're trying to achieve through transportation, is access to destinations that straight up measurements of congestion probably aren't really measuring what we're trying to achieve. They're measuring something that's fairly uh, unconnected and unrelated, that's kind of a surrogate measure for what we're really trying to measure, which is, are people getting to where they need to go in a way that supports their lives, supports community, supports our, environment, our, our economic goals and the like? What are the measures that you're talking about when you talk about uh, measurements of success that are reportable in, in ways that we would understand as policymakers in ways that the public would understand? Thank you, Mr. Chair. In terms of measures, we are, are currently working on updating our strategic operating plan, and that's in alignment with the Governor's One Minnesota plan. So we've had performance measures and a dashboard for those that are on our website for things that we have historically measured for, for some time now. Um, however, as we're moving into different areas that um, are, are newer for the department to be focusing on. We're in the process of developing measures, so measures for advancing transportation equity, for instance, any additional safety measures we should be looking at. We have our operational measures, too, that we can add to what we do right now for um, measuring how reactive we are out on the system. So those are just some examples of what we're going to be talking about over the coming months here as we're operating, or excuse me, as we're updating our operating, strategic operating plan. But those are also measures that we want to hear and, and work with you legislators on to understand what you would like to see measured too so that they're meaningful um, to to you all as well as to all of our stakeholders and not just uh, not just meaningful to MnDOT. All right thank you um, I appreciate that response and I appreciate the invitation for us to participate and members I think I think we'll take the commissioner up on that because I think that would be a very very interesting hearing and conversation to have um, and you know maybe even some policy direction that we might consider um, uh, to the to the to the commissioner and to the agency. Um, other questions, members. Uh, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Commissioner Dobbenberger. Uh, we've had a, a private conversation as well with staff and, and talking about the upcoming session. So I thank you for that. Um, and just a couple questions on a couple things. Um, you know, Senator Newman. In, in previous years, we've talked a lot about leakages and, and losing that money from what should be used for highway purposes and being used on administrative type issues. So can you expand a little bit on, on what your thought process is, how we've had that discussion in the past couple years, and how you'll address that? Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator. Um, when, it, when it comes to eligible uses of trunk highway funds, I mean, MnDOT certainly follows the state constitution and all applicable laws to determine whether trunk highway funds can be used on any particular expense. Um, the Dedicated Funds Expenditures Task Force, which included several legislators, um, worked over the last, uh, during the last session, but uh, over the last previous year, um, and looking at those issues, they did examine them very thoroughly, and they know they, they found points of both consensus and disagreement, um, but uh, it didn't uh, result in any specific findings or recommendations, things to do differently. However, that said, I am I'm more than happy to have further conversations about that, take questions as they, they come up um, in terms of the use of trunk highway funds and uh, be happy to hear from you all of what uh, what your interests are in that in looking into that further. Thank you. And follow up. Uh, yes, Senator Trzinski. Mr. Chair, and we've had a lot of discussion. Uh, many of us here at the table, we've talked about uh, earmarks or uh, constituent requests and, and the importance of some of those. Can you also discuss a little bit of your opinions on that and, and how we've done it in the past and, and the importance of those as a legislator and then understanding also all, there's also a lot that are in the program as well, either in the CHIP or the STIP, but how, how you'll address uh, constituent requests and, and how that falls into our legislative purview? Commissioner. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator. Uh, you know, we, at the legislators, uh, legislature's direction, uh, MnDOT implemented a, a project selection policy a few years ago, and that includes um, project scores. And to increase transparency, we put those out on our website where people can track project selection. And uh, for the first time since uh, I can remember having um, out there on a website for the public to see how um, how a public, or excuse me, how a project ranks in comparison to the others, and then why it wasn't selected for um, entering our, our four-year program. Um, we have a public process for project input and selection, and it's decentralized. In, in other words, it's out in each of MnDOT's district. We use our ATPs, our area transportation partnerships, so cities, counties, and townships to provide input on projects, and that's all taken into account as we work through the project selection process. So um, we also have a couple of programs that the legislature established, our, TED pro our Transportation and Economic Development Program, as well as Quarters of Commerce, um, that get at the needs of those projects that don't rise up in MnDOT's project select, uh, selection process. And as I noted, we worked with legislators on those programs, so um, we'd be happy to continue to work with you on any other programs that could get at different types of projects. Thank you, and um, members, uh, thank you, Senator Jasinski. I'm glad you asked the question. Um, so while I'm thinking of it, and before I, f before I forget, um, I would invite everyone, of course, um, as well as you know, everyone else in the legislature to put in your bills with your local community requests, <laughs> your hopes and your dreams and your aspirations for uh, what you need for transportation uh, in your communities, and we will hear all of those bills. We'll have call show and tell day. Um, might take a couple of days. It's usually a lot of bills. Um, and we'll also take that opportunity, uh, Commissioner, maybe to talk more thoroughly about how the uh, capital improvements program, how the STIP is created, how um, the public, how community leaders, how legislators can influence uh, project selection um, as things are today outside of specific legislative direction. Um, so we'll have a more thorough conversation about how that exactly works, um, which would be inclusive of some fairly robust improvements we made, which the commissioner touched on in the recent past at the behest and urging and leadership of um, legislators, including um, Republican uh, leadership um, that was uh, really excellent at the time. So I just wanted to make note of that. Other questions, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Not, not really much a question, but uh, I just want to make a comment that I've had a good working relationship with uh, Commissioner Daubenberger as, as the vice chair over a year, and I uh, will support uh, her recommendation for confirmation. i just uh, a little bit concerned that we have three new members, Senator Morrison, Senator Port, and Senator Lang, who really have had no experience, and this is the first meeting we're having and we're looking at uh, confirming already. So that would be my only concern. Again, I want to make sure that you know I've had a good relationship, and I have uh, no doubt that you'll continue to be a, a great commissioner, and I want to thank you for that, and thank you for being accessible uh, to me in the last past year for any question I've had. So thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Senator Jasinski. Um, I would invite the new members to meet with independently with Commissioner Daubenberger before the confirmation is taken up on the floor. Um, if you have not yet had that opportunity, um, you know, please let me know if you're so inclined um, when you're comfortable moving forward with the vote on the floor of the Senate. I will say, however, that Commissioner Daubenberger has been um, the commissioner now for some time, plus with her uh, fairly extensive uh, resume that we have in front of us and her um, presentation. Um, we know that um, she's well qualified and in my opinion has done an excellent job throughout her uh, professional experience at the Department of Transportation and as commissioner. Um, and, uh, and really confirmation is a measure or an indication of of the quality uh, uh, and the um, qualifications of those whom the governor has selected to serve on his leadership team. Um, and I think it's readily apparent that Nancy Daubenberger meets that test. Any other questions, members? 
Um, this is a public hearing, um, and so to that end, I will invite anyone forward who would like to provide testimony on the question of confirming Nancy Daubenberger as Commissioner of Transportation. Would anyone like to testify? There are a couple of submittals in our packet, letters of support for her appointment. All right, seeing no one stepping forward, um, would anyone like to make a motion? Vice Chair Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to recommend that the appointment of Nancy Daubenberger to the position of Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Transportation be confirmed. All right, uh, any further members? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, you, Mr. Chair. members, now we will transition into a little bit of a presentation overview I think more focused on the fiscal elements and the uh, f uh, fiscal forecast, not so much an overview of the department itself. Um, again, in, in light of the fact that uh, things are not quite the same as we're hearing about in the general fund. A little different uh, with the transportation dedicated sources. So we'll have a little transition time for technology. All right, Mr. Rudin. And Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Eric Rudin with MnDOT Government Affairs. It's uh, good to see everyone at the start of a new session. Look forward to working with you. I'm actually uh, just going to be here to help respond to questions, and Mr. Brown uh, will be handling the presentation today. Mr. Kanata Rudhubinger is out of town. So um, Sam Brown is our budget director and he will be making the presentation. All right, thank you. Uh, welcome to the committee. Mr. Brown, please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your presentation. Perfect, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, uh, members. Uh, for the record, my name is Sam Brown. I am the interim budget director at the Department of Transportation. Uh, today we are here to present uh, an update on the November 22 forecast and the impact to transportation funding. Uh, along with myself and Eric Rudine, uh, we have others today to help with any specific questions, especially as it relates to the modes and funding for local roads and bridges. I do want to make sure that everyone is aware and has access to our forecast document um, that is posted on our website and will be referred to uh, as part of this presentation. Members, it's in your packet. Earlier in December, uh, MMB released the forecast to the general fund, which had the 17.6 billion uh, surplus. Uh, today, though, we'll be focusing specifically on different revenue sources uh, related to various modes of transportation. Uh, in consultation with Minnesota Management and Budget, as well as the Department of Revenue, MnDOT prepares fund statements for the six transportation funds on the screen. Uh, that includes the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund, uh, which will be referred to often as the HUTD Fund, our Trunk Highway Fund, our County State Aid Highway Fund, often referred to as CASA, the Municipal State Aid Streets Fund, also often referred to as MSAS, as well as State Airports Fund and our Transit Assistance Fund. Uh, this forecast includes actuals from fiscal year 22, as well as updates for fiscal year 23 through 25 uh, from our February forecast, as well as uh, updates for the fiscal year 26-27 biennium. Uh, much of today's presentation uh, will focus on revenues that fund our state highway system, our 87 counties across Minnesota, as well as our streets in, within our Minnesota's municipalities. Uh, the HUT, HUTD fund uh, receives three primary sources of revenue. That would be the gas tax, uh, the tab fees, or motor vehicle registration tax, and then our MVEST, which is the motor vehicle sales tax. Uh, there are also several other revenue sources, um, including our state sales tax on motor vehicle repair and replacement parts. Uh, just to familiarize yourself with this chart, uh, the, the top row of boxes on 
depicts these revenue sources along with the amount and then percentages of funding within the HUTD. Of the total uh, revenue deposited into the HUTD, after the gas tax uh, revenue is transferred to DNR, a portion of the gas tax uh, is transferred to the DNR, 95% is allocated by constitutional formula to the Trunk Highway Fund, to the CASA Fund, and then to the MSAS Fund. Uh, the 5% set aside um, is allocated for township roads, township bridges, and our flexible highway account. And then a, a smaller amount of the gas tax is transferred to the DNR for various activities related to motorboats, uh, snowmobiles, all-terrain vehicles, uh, to name a few. So we will transition now to talk briefly about the primary revenue sources that are deposited uh, into the HUTD fund. Just to familiarize yourself with these charts, uh, the green bars represent revenues projected as part of the November 22 forecast, while the blue lines represent estimates that we made last, last February of 22. Uh, the current gas tax rate in Minnesota is 28 and a half cents. That's 25 cents plus a three and a half debt service surcharge. This surcharge is intended to partially cover debt obligations for capital projects on the trunk highway system. The outlook for fuel consumption is largely affected by vehicles miles traveled and vehicle uh, or fuel efficiency of vehicles. So relying heavily on most current projections from IHS market, which is the same economic uh, consultant MMB uses in developing the general fund forecast, we are anticipating revenues to increase only slightly in fiscal year 23 and 24 before gas tax revenues begin to de decrease by less than 1% in uh, future years of the forecast. These decreases that we start seeing in later years are largely due to fuel efficiency. The motor vehicle registration revenue is based on the value and age of a vehicle. Uh, overall, vehicle sales are expected to, to continue to grow in future years uh, according to the most current IHS market forecast. Um, this will certainly impact registration revenue and, explain the year over, and explains the year-over-year -year growth we anticipate throughout the forecast period. However, revenue collected thus far in fiscal year 23 is currently well below what we had forecasted um, in February of 22, and as a result, only grows minimally in the current fiscal year. Thereafter, uh, revenue growth is projected to grow approximately 4% per year on average over the forecast period. Motor vehicle sales tax, MVEST, are subject to a 6.5% motor vehicle sales tax. This includes sales by car dealers as well as private individuals. Uh, of this revenue, currently 60% is deposited into the HUTD fund, and the remaining 40% is deposited into Transit Assistance Fund, uh, which I'll cover in it later in this presentation. Uh, working with the Department of Revenue, they prepare the, the forecast for this revenue source. And overall, uh, MVEST revenue is projected to decrease compared to what we were seeing in the February 22 forecast. So when looking at all HUTD revenues, overall, they are down by approximately 3.5% in the current biennium. Uh, this is compared to what we saw in uh, February of 2022 and that's approximately $184 million. In fiscal year 24-25, uh, revenues are down again compared to what we were seeing in the February 22 forecast, but uh, by approximately 3.8% or $209 million. So much of the discussion thus far has compared revenue amounts to previous forecasts. Uh, this chart on the screen summarizes year-over-year -year growth within the HUTD fund. 
So we've covered gas tax, tab fees, and motor vehicle sales tax in much more detail. But overall, revenue does continue to grow uh, year over year. In fiscal year 23, we are forecasting a 2.5% growth within the HUTD compared to 20, fiscal year 22. However, that growth rate is less than we assumed last February, as highlighted in the bottom row of this table. This change in revenue we are seeing as part of the November forecast impacts funds allocated to the Trunk Highway Fund as well as to the CASA and MSAS funds. The table on this slide focuses on available Trunk Highway Fund balance and how that has changed from the February 22 forecast. MnDOT's internal policy requires a portion of Trunk Highway funds be reserved to protect against a major shortfall in revenue. There is a Bit of detail on this slide, so I will spend a few minutes just walking through a couple of the lines. Um, the first line is the available fund balance we projected as part of the February 22 forecast. Following this line um, are the changes to trunk highway revenue, including the HUTD revenue that's deposited, the federal revenue, um, as well as other trunk highway revenues and prior year adjustments. The substantial change in federal revenues we are seeing in fiscal year 24 and 25, so that 180 million and then the in 24 and the 149 million in fiscal year 25, that's recognizing the IIJA funding, which is the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. However, um, since last session adjourned without uh, increasing the budget authority, MnDOT's spending line does not change in future years in the biennium. As a result, by the end of the fiscal year 24-25, there is over $400 million available in unreserved trunk highway funds. Um, as noted on, that, on the third to the bottom line, again, this is largely to, due to not having the budget authority to spend the IAJA funds. Um, assuming MnDOT receives the necessary budget authority as part of this legislative session, um, it would leave approximately $23 million only for unreserved fund balance per year. Before we switch our attention to funding for other modes, I will briefly cover this slide which depicts debt service estimates compared to the policy limits over the forecast period. Uh, MnDOT's internal debt management policy states that debt service should not exceed 20% of annual state revenues to the Trunk Highway Fund. The table shows the estimated debt service costs from the Trunk Highway Fund, which ranged from nearly 14% in 22 to um, up to 18.7% in fiscal year 27. So to remain within policy limits, uh, there's approximately $225 million in additional bonding capacity. Uh, however, bonding capacity could increase slightly uh, if the, the authorization is spent, spread over multiple years. So I'll quickly transition uh, to funding for local roads and bridges, keeping track of the time here. Um, the CASA fund receives transfers from the HUTD fund and revenue from investment income as well as a portion of the motor vehicle lease sales tax. Uh, Minnesota statute then provides the criteria by which this, these funds are allocated across Minnesota's 87 counties. Uh, MSAS also receives transfers from the HUTD fund uh, and Minnesota statute also provides the criteria for how funds are allocated ag across cities that have a population of uh, 5,000 or greater. Um, as I mentioned back on slide three, uh, the town road and bridge funding is that 5% set aside um, for the portion of revenue that's deposited into the HUTD fund. And um, this allocation process and statute occurs as part of the commissioner's order. Uh, we are currently working on that at MnDOT um, and will be using this information from the November forecast. Um, I do want to note that while there's still some adjustments that may occur as we go through the calculations for the distrib distribution, 
Um, based on November forecast, the allocations are now down about 4% compared to what we were seeing in 2022. In regards to transit, I will largely be speaking to Greater Minnesota Transit. Uh, the Transit Assistance Fund receives revenue from motor vehicle sales tax, as well as the motor vehicle lease sales tax. 40% uh, of the total motor vehicle sales tax is uh, collected and then deposited into the Transit Assistance Fund. Of this revenue, 90% is allocated to Met Council for Metropolitan Transit, and then the remaining 10% goes to MnDOT for Greater Minnesota Transit. Uh, as of fiscal year 2018, 38% of motor vehicle lease sales tax is allocated to transit in Greater Minnesota. So when looking at the revenues for Greater Minnesota Transit, uh, and those are the top two highlighted lines, I know the, the print is very fine there, so. Apologies, but we are seeing revenue well below what we forecasted in February 22. Um, in fiscal year 23, motor vehicle sales tax is down approximately 5%, and motor vehicle lease sales tax is down nearly 20%. Um, while we are able to maintain current spending in fiscal year 23 for greater Minnesota transit, the fund is not in compliance with the current fund balance policy. Um, as shown on this slide, we assume utilizing a portion of the fund balance reserves and then restoring the fund balance in fiscal year 24 and 25. Um, with that, though, um, starting in fiscal year 24 and beyond, the program funding for Greater Minnesota um, is set at approximately $64 million, uh, which is down from nearly $73 million a year in the February 22 forecast. So nearly 12.5%. The last fund that I'll focus on uh, this afternoon is our state airports fund. Um, as it relates to state airport funding, there are three funds that make up the total consolidated state airport fund, and those include the state airport fund, as well as the hangar revolving loan fund, and the air transportation service revolving fund. I uh, will be focusing today on the specific, uh, the, the state airports fund, uh, where 133 publicly owned airports receive state funds. And on this chart, that's the, the red box. Uh, the forecast for the state airport fund is focused on the sales tax of aircraft, airline flight property tax, aircraft registration taxes, and aviation, gasoline, and special fuel taxes. The forecast for the sales tax on aircraft and the registration taxes are both based primarily on previous year um, and, and prior history, but those are very volatile and can swing from year to year. Uh, the aviation tax is anticipated to increase over the forecast period compared to the February 22 forecast. Um, overall, state airport fund revenues are up by nearly 14% in fiscal year 23. So we are currently projecting both a one-time surplus of uh, 13.7 million in fiscal year 23 uh, in this fund and an additional ongoing surplus of in starting in fiscal year 24 of approximately $2 million. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, um, greatly appreciate the tip time to provide uh, an update on transportation funding. Uh, Eric, myself, are available if there are any questions. Thank you, Mr. Brown. So airports are flush. What are we going to do with all that money? <laughs> <laughs> uh, appreciate the presentation. Members, just for your information, um, we did get the word that we're going back on the floor at 445. They can delay for us. We, we can't be meeting if we're going to go on the floor. They did say they'd be willing to delay for us if we need to get through committee business. However, I do think they're also only requiring a skeleton crew to receive a committee report and pass it along to its next stop. But in any case, they can't meet until we either decide to temporarily adjourn or finish our business. I would recommend that we just plow through, ask our questions, and uh, get on with it. So questions, members? Senator Jasinski. Sure. 
excuse me one second. Can you go to it's on page eight on our handout? Um, fiscal year 24 and the HUTDF revenues. Uh, MVEST uh, is pretty much stable with the exception of 24 going down by 1.4%. What's the reasoning behind the, that going down in 2024? Chair, Mr. Brown. Chair Dibble, members. Um, that is correct, um, and the Department of Revenue does do the official forecast, so I can speak to it. Um, the motor vehicle sales tax, um, that is largely based on the IHS market data that the MMB's general fund um, forecast is developed. They are, um, as you may have heard as part of the MMB forecast for the general funds, there is the potential for a recession, uh, and this is reflecting that drop we see in one the 1.4 percent before it then bounces back up again starting in future years. So that's kind of in line with what the IHS market was showing. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Thank you. So uh, members, um, uh, thank you all very much. Appreciate your time. Um, uh, just to wrap up a little bit here, a couple of closing thoughts. One is um, uh, you know, get your bills in. We've got only a few bills in so far that have been referred to transportation, so get them on in. Send your uh, committee hearing requests in. Um, I know there'll be a little bit of a trickle at the outset, but uh, um, like I said, you know, I'll definitely hear all of the local projects bills. What The way I'm thinking of organizing the committee um, hearings is to um, try to organize our bills thematically around subject areas, you know, have a day or, you know, or a group of days around safety, for example, or um, environment or access or, you know, other, other kinds of things. Um, uh, everyone knows kind of the rhythm of the, of the legislature. We have the first and second committee uh, deadlines in hand. I think the third committee is, uh, the third committee deadline is, is still being um, determined, but it's probably going to be after we come back from spring break and um, of course we know we'll have the February forecast um, in later February the uh, I think the governor's budget submittal will come in a little bit before that and then his revised budget will come in a little after that and then uh, and then it will really be uh, rolling up our sleeves to fashion uh, a budget um, and so we'll you know we'll be doing that of course in in March um, and that'll be when we really have a lot of fun um, I had one more thought, but it escapes me. So until we, oh, Wednesday. Wednesday, we are hearing um, the driver's license for all bill. So that'll be a big day. Um, that's still all that we'll be hearing. Um, a lot of people will be here. Um, so I wanted everyone to be aware of that and, and be ready for that hearing on Wednesday. Anything further, members? With that, we are adjourned. Thank you.